Okay, we're recording. Um, so the title of this video is Propositional Attitudes. And as the title promises, I'm going to explain to you what propositional attitudes are. We're talking about, excuse me, sorry. We're talking about a philosophy of mind and cognitive studies. And we're going to talk about the propositional attitude model of intentional states. So we're going to find out what propositional attitude attitudes are. Uh, but we're also going to talk about the concept of intentionality and the concept of intentional states. Um, so, and then, so I'm going to do that. The first thing I'm going to do is, is uh, it's just instructional about what uh, propositional attitudes are, what that means in cognitive studies. And then the second part, I'm going to explain some of my own uh, metaphysical misgivings about representational theories of mind. The propositional attitudes are a particular kind of or model of a representational theory of mind. So, um, you know, me having the position that I have, I had to, I also wanted to get on to, uh, to some of that metaphysical critique. But, but, you know, first off, let's figure out what propositional attitudes are. Maybe you're taking a philosophy of mind class uh, or a philosophy of psychology class. And this phrase propositional attitudes has come up and you've Googled it and you're trying to figure out what it means. Uh, okay, that's what I'm here for today. I'm going to try and tell you what propositional attitudes are. So let me get up my screen share daily here. Uh, and Jerry, I'm all the way at the end of it, but here we are at the beginning. And then put up my little, I'm so professional. All right, here we are. Propositional attitudes, that is the propositional attitude model of intentional psychology. I'm going to go over all of these things a couple of times because it's hard, right? There's a lot of jargon here. Propositional attitudes, intentional psychology. It's, but these are mouthful things. Um, there's not that many of them, though, and I'm going to keep repeating them over and over again. I think we'll get a little bit of better handle on what all this means. Um, intentional psychology, by the way, and I'll say this again as we go on, isn't anything very complicated or anything you have to sort of learn what it is. Intentional psychology is uh it, the way we ordinarily explain to each other our own and other people's behavior just in terms of beliefs and desires and other words like belief and desire i'm going to talk about that set of words so again it's nothing that you don't already know about it's nothing you don't already do nobody has to be taught how to do intentional psychology intentional psychology is just what you're already doing when you understand people's behavior in terms of their beliefs and desires and hopes and fears and that's how you explain it. And that's how you describe it when other people are asking you about people's behavior, again, including your own. So uh, intentional psychology itself is then a very quotidian thing. It's just all, all that means is uh, ordinary. Sometimes we even call this folk psychology, psychology in terms of beliefs, desires, hopes, fears, suspicions, expectations, and so on. Okay. Now, um, so you have behaviors in the early 20th century. We're going to talk about Noam Chomsky's generative grammar. This is the thing, of course, Noam Chomsky nowadays famous as a political activist, but Noam Chomsky, uh, particularly in the late 1950s and 1960s, really made his name with these ideas, which were his responses to behaviorist thinkers like uh, B.F. Skinner at the time in the 1950s. So this is important if you're a psychology student or uh, or into philosophy of mind or linguistics, you know, uh, where Noam Chomsky is hugely influential, then you do want to sort of have a handle on what's meant by generative grammar. All right, well, I'm just going to read through this slide and let's see. There's a, you know, all of these, th this is very compressed and all these things are things we could talk about a lot. So in the early 20th century, you have behaviorism. For us right now, let's think about behaviorism this way. Let's say this, that if you wanted to do science, then you're going to limit yourself to things that are observable and things that are intersubjectively observable that you and other people can both see. So those things can also be sort of measured and quantified and so on. So behaviorism really the approach is to say, well, let's just follow good scientific methodology. Put the thing back in my mouth, the lozenge. Let's just follow good scientific methodology and then ipso facto, that is just by virtue of doing that, then we'll be doing science. And that way we can do a science of psychology. And you can, you know, you can accept behaviorism on that level on one of two ways. I mean, you could say, okay, well then when we're at work and trying to be professionals, we'll do that. 
Or you could take it to a deeper level and say, this is really getting at some fundamental mistakes people are making in psychology. And I'm going to go there uh, at the end of this presentation. Um, but in any event, behaviorism then in the early 20th century naturalized, what does naturalized mean? Integrated into the natural sciences or into the physical sciences. A very important point here about the physical sciences or saying it's something scientific. <laughs> Sorry. Is this that science, physical science, studies physical relationships between physical causal relationships, that is, between physical properties and things and processes. And that is the limit of physical science. That is. So another way of looking at it is the only thing that physical science is ever going to talk about are physical things, physical objects, physical qualities, physical processes, and so on. Um, that's what naturalized means. So the reason that psychology still has this philosophical side is there's still philosophical inquiry going on with, with psychological concepts is because some of these really central concepts, which some people would even argue are quite inelimitable, you couldn't do without them, don't look like they're entirely naturalized. It looks like they have meanings that refer to sort of non-physical properties or non-physical processes. Well, that's what we're gonna look at. So, um, so behaviorism offered a naturalized psychology in the scope of scientific psychology to intersubjectively observable things thus ipso facto making psychology a science. First sentence on the slide here. So when I say Lockean learning model, that is behaviorism really wanted to strip and empiricism in general uh, as, a, as a philosophy of psychology really wants to strip the model down to the most basic, basic elements in hopes of being able to map the psychological and the physical stuff onto each other in a more coherent manner, in fact. The same reason why Sigmund Freud talks about basic drives for that matter, because he sees, sees himself as a medical doctor and he wants to um, map up the behavioral dispositions with physical uh, descriptions. Okay, so um, Noam Chomsky did not like the sound of behaviorism at all. He was certainly not the only one to react this way. There's quite a lot of interesting cultural artifacts from the mid-century about behaviorism and reactions to behaviorism. Aldous Huxley, George Orwell, all kinds of stuff to look at, uh, not to mention Conrad Lorenz and other important psychologists and mythologists of the time. In any event, Chomsky was one. He didn't like it that it was a technology of control. Again, he is a very political person, and God bless him for that. Um, so he wanted to get humans basically out of the behaviorist paradigm, <laughs> which was essentially that positive and negative reinforcements, that is learning experiences are what shape the behaviors of animals. And then of course also innate behaviors, which you know, again, isn't part of what um, behaviorism says, but uh, all right. So generative grammar then, the last point, the last bullet point on the slide, generative grammar is this, that because you have these grammatical structures of pronouns and adverbs and, and, and formalities, important that some of these formalities seem to be um, contingent, that's taken to be evidence that they're a product of evolutionary processes, which is a reasonable enough claim to make, I guess. I think sometimes linguists seem to think that's more significant than I see, but in any event. Um, <coughs> uh, so in the example, the blank is blank the blank. The nation is tired of the TV show. I don't know, the cat is on the mat. Uh, the planet is in orbit around the star. I mean, there's an awful lot of different things that you can hang on the grammatical structure. So when you call it generative grammar, that is novel sentences can be generative. Chomsky even points out that recursion, which is just, what, what does that mean that I can say? I'm thinking about the fact that I'm thinking about the fact that I'm thinking about the fact, right? Uh, that shows that that just proves, doesn't it? That you can in fact generate an infinite number of uh, utterances if you have grammar. 
um, other places in my videos here, you can see discussion, for example, of the ape language, sign language studies of the 70s and 80s, because there, of course, uh, it was, in fact, people like the gardeners who were behaviorists who were trying to show that the animals actually could master grammar rules against um, Amatists and people like Chomsky who are arguing that that was not the case, and that, in fact, uh, language was just an innate uh, genetic trait of humans and unique to humans. Uh, again, another really important point for Chomsky. With Chomsky, though, you know, his kind of humanistic goals and his scientific goals, I'm not saying this makes them invalid, but they're always kind of mixed together. Anyway, these books, Language and Thought rules and representations. Without the rules, the grammar rules, you can't form the representations. Put even more directly, without language, you can't think. There's a difference between language and thought. That doesn't look right to me, by the way. It looks to me as if language is going to have to be something that's built out from something that's thought, that's pre-linguistic. Um, but these are the kinds of things that people argue about. Notice that even anthropologists and primatologists can get in on this kind of action, and they do. Um, so, all right, so Chomsky's generative grammar. The fact that human beings have this grammatical superstructure, if you will, that they can use, it can use to generate all kinds of new sentences, sentences that nobody ever said before. The cupcake is on the giraffe, et cetera. Um, this is the argument. Uh, one notice one problem I'm going to have with this argument is it draws a very sharp divide between linguistic animals and non-linguistic animals, and that's one of the things I'm going to talk about during uh, this show today. But but right now we're getting ready still to understand what propositional attitudes are. Propositions. Now we can fine tune a little bit. A proposition is a well-formed uh, linguistic object, a grammatically well-formed linguistic object is what it is. Uh, so now let's talk about what intentionality is. I find in general that oftentimes people trying to figure out philosophy of mind will come across this phrase intentionality. And also sometimes when I talk to research scientists, which I do, uh, they'll express frustration with this term intentionality. You know, what does it sort of mean? Uh, for me, and I'll tell you what, I, what it means. Um, it means being about something. When I'm thinking about the planet Neptune, it's about Neptune. If I think Neptune is green, I'm in some kind of state that's about the planet Neptune, which is really far away from me right now, and I'm not looking at it or anything. But also, when I think that tomorrow we're going to sort of order calzones because it's a holiday and we're going to do takeout, you know, that looks like I'm also thinking about something that's distal, that's farther, that's, that's not here. I can represent things. Um, so notice then that there's a certain set of words, belief, desire, hope, fear, expectation, suspicion, intention in an ordinary sense, and so on, quite a few of them that are all, you, you, don't, you don't just have a belief that doesn't have an object. A belief is a belief about something, you know? So, so it individuates one belief from another is its content, the thing that the belief is about, and so on with the desires and the hopes and the fears and the other intentional states. So now we can say what we mean by intentional state. It's not the happiest phrase really, but intentional state means a belief, that's being an intentional state. I'm in the state of believing that Neptune is green. I'm in the state of desiring some ice cream and so forth. Right, I'm in these intentional states, if you want. The whole language with uh, psychological attribution, are we saying that they have, the, the, the person we're describing, are they in some sort of state or what is it? You know, notice that's the kind of problem that we're dealing with here because we're looking at these concepts and trying to try figure out what it is we're referring to when we use the psychological words. So one set of words, belief, desire, hope, fear, and so on, what, what makes them all similar to each other? Why are they all the same? You have to be able to see that because it's not arbitrary. It's that they all have objects, they all have content, a desire for something, a hope for something, a fear of something, a suspicion about something, about something, content, mental content. So mental content are these things that you're thinking about. That's the contents of your thoughts. How are those contents represented? We're talking about mental representation. 
Uh, think of a tiger for a second, just by the way. Okay, you're thinking about tiger for me now? Just imagine a tiger. Now tell me, how many stripes did your tiger have? Well, you know, now you can assign a number of stripes to your imaginary tiger if you want, but before I asked you how many stripes your tiger had, I doubt you actually had assigned an actual number of stripes to your tiger. Why not? Because you didn't have to. Compare filming a movie where you have to scout the location and dress everyone with writing a book where you could write something like, uh, you know, in the, in the pre-dawn light, the, the Russian Gutierrez rolled down, uh, rode down on the French encampment or something. Um, I notice that you can do formal representation, linguistic representation with, with well, how many letters are in the alphabet? 26, I think, I always get that wrong. Very few. So cognitive scientists, and I think this makes perfect sense uh, and does probably get a better understanding how the brain works, it, you know, uh, think that in general, that it's gonna be some kind of formal representation like linguistic representation putting the letters together rather than imagistic representation. Although there is interesting research on that from the 1980s, Coslin, somebody to check out. Uh, so the intentional vocabulary is this vocabulary and intentionality is that property of referring to something else. Um, I'm in an intentional state when I think about my dog, I'm in an intentional state when I think about Venus, I'm in an intentional state when I think about ice cream and so on. So as I said before, this isn't anything fancy. I mean, I, you know, this, I, don't, don't uh, overthink this and, and get boggled. This is, no one's telling you anything you don't really pretty much already know. Um, second bullet point this is my standard classroom example. You know, well, wh why did he leave just then? Somebody says, well, because he was thirsty. And that's just a typical, by the way, that's intentional psychology. Why did he leave? Because he was thirsty. You know, um, that's all, it's nothing fancy. You know, what does he want? He wants this. That's all. Uh, but look, uh, you can unpack it. He had a belief uh, that the water was down the hall. He had a desire to get some water. All other things being equal, his belief and his desire combined uh, to form, to cause him to form the intention to get into the mental state of having an intention of walking down the hall to where he believed that the water was. Why do you leave? Because he was thirsty. You know, unpack it, analyze it. It unpacks and analyzes like that. I say on that first bullet point, it's a subset of the larger psychological vocabulary. Another um, set of psychological words for another day are the phenomenal words like pain and sensation and texture and so on. But don't refer to anything. And they have their own philosophical issues. But anyway, back to what we're talking about. Uh, um, psycho so last bullet point then, psychological explanations in terms of mental causation as distinct from physical explanations, which include only physical references. And I'm gonna get into that a little bit more now because another issue here is when we look at metaphysics, why is there a metaphysical problem? That's only when you can't deal with everything in physical terms. And you know, um, philosophers are perfectly okay with the idea that if you can find uh, sort of maybe some kind of logical or grammatical or theoretical or even just factual, piece of the puzzle that you're missing and maybe that that what looks like a, a a deep philosophical problem might just maybe go away that's fine with philosophers you know that's 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 sort of what they want if they, i think if they're good um so one more go at what intentional states are um and what the propositional attitude towards uh, intentional states is that is an intentional state then is a attitude towards a proposition, a proposition like the cat is on the mat, uh, the nation is tired, uh, I want some ice cream, or, and so on. And again, so what are the attitudes, literally? The attitudes literally are just those words, belief, desire, hope, fear, fear is an attitude, an attitude towards the proposition that the raptor's in the kitchen, right? Uh, an attitude really based on um, towards the truth value. What's the truth value? That's another fancy philosophical term. It just means that it's either true or false. But notice I'm not true or false and my hand is not true or false and my lamp is not true or false. It only looks like these linguistic objects are true or false, but physical objects are not true or false. And that means that if you wanna have a naturalistic model 
that only deals with physical processes and properties and things, then you don't want anything that's true or false in your model. But here uh, in the uh, propositional attitude model towards intentional states, we certainly do. Um, and notice something else then, and this is sort of Chomsky's point, or, or sort of a, con a point of contention, let me say. That is, the point here is that if you don't have these grammar rules, then you cannot be said to actually be an intentional state, since what intentional states are is attitudes towards propositions. And if you don't have the grammar rules, uh, you can't form the propositions. And that means if you don't have uh, language and grammar, then you can't be said to be a being that believes and desires and hopes and fears. And that is a really pretty radical outcome. Um, it's an outcome with which I disagree, but it's important right now just to see how that follows. I mean, again, you know, you can't, in order to have beliefs and desires and hopes and fears, you know, what are those? Those are attitudes towards propositions. The mental content is the proposition. Uh, and if you can't form one, then uh, you can't be said to be in one of those states, to be in a state of believing or desiring and so on. Uh, we're going to talk about animal minds. I'm into it. Uh, this is, uh, as far as I know, the only argument that is, you know, even remotely persuasive in terms of um, saying that you're warranted literally in making intentional attributions to humans, but not to non-linguistic humans like dogs and cats. Uh, I don't know of any other good reason to think anything of the sort at all, but if you thought that mental representations were uh, involved grammatically well-formed propositions and you had to be a linguistic animal to do that, well, then uh, yeah, that does follow. So, um, and also, by the way, let's talk about mental causation. Um, another thing we, we learn about when we're looking at philosophy of mind is that um, these are still real issues and, and live issues. And we're gonna talk about that also, you had a problem of mental causation back in the 1600s when Descartes was writing about uh, the mind. The problem of mental causation back then was the problem I would call sort of the Casper the friendly ghost problem. That is, you know, Casper's immaterial. He passes through doors and walls. So then how, come, how can Casper possibly have a causal interaction with a physical object? How can Casper knock over the first domino in the row of dominoes, if Casper has no mass, if Casper has none of these properties that you know Locke referred to as the extended, right, and, and uh, the, the substance discussion Descartes was on that too. Uh, so, so second bullet point. Well, okay, but so what? I mean, here we are in the twenty first century, and we don't believe in uh, in the ghost in the machine. We don't believe in immaterial souls. We're physicalists, aren't we? We're naturalists. We think of that we live in a universe, uh, a natural universe we can describe at the micro level of cells and atoms in physical terms, at the macro level of galaxies and nebulae in physical terms. So we don't have the Casper the friendly ghost problem. True enough, but we do still have a problem of mental causation. What's the modern problem of mental causation? The modern problem of mental causation, notice in, in our example, why do you leave because he was thirsty? It's because it was a belief about the location of the water. It was the desire specifically for the water. Uh, that is to say, it was the meaning of the propositions, the semantic content of the propositions that was playing the causal role in the production of the behavior. And, and think, suppose this, let me just step out of here for a second and also give us a break from being in the in this all the time. So suppose, you know, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm there, I'm in class, somebody gets up and leaves, I ask, why do you leave? And suppose that you said that your answer to me was as follows. Suppose that when I asked you, why do you leave? That what you said was, well, there was some kind of um, electrochemical event in his neocortex and it sent an electrical impulse uh, down his spine uh, that 
that went out to the to the muscles the the nerves went out to the muscles and shocked them so they contracted and that caused the bones to swivel on the joints and then he walked out like frankenstein's monster right that's why why do you leave i asked well that i mean that might even all just be true enough. I mean, you might be giving me an accurate enough description of the physical processes that are happening in his, in his body. But it's, but look, it's not the explanation that I wanted, is it? Is it now? No, it's not. I, I, I said, why did he leave? He said, because he was thirsty. That was the answer that I wanted. The answer in terms of these intentional states that he was in. And I can't get anything about that when you just give me that, you know, really kind of bizarre, you know, just base physical level, you know, physiological level description. It's not the description that I want. The, the reduction doesn't go through. So notice the issue for philosophy of science here and psychology, right? The issue is psychology made a natural science or not. And I said, there's still a problem of mental causation, even if we don't think that the mind is like Casper the Friendly Ghost. And the problem with, you know, the problem we see here with mental causation is it looks like the semantic content of the propositions is actually playing the causal role in the production of behavior. And notice also that it's the logical relationship between the propositions, that I have a desire for water and I believe that the water is over there. Those two, you know, have a logical relationship to each other, all other things being equal. So it looks like there's another non-physical property, which is the property of being logical grasping logical relations because notice that the propositions are the things that appear to have logical relations so uh, all right so let's go back to the screen share Do that. Um, so last bullet point again uh, the problem is appears it's the meaning of the mental representations that plays the causal role and we don't have Psychophysical laws. So there's another big word. What does that mean? Laws that are going to map the neurophysiological description and explanation onto the intentional psychological des description and explanation, and vice versa. In some persuasive and coherent way, I'm not sure what that would even be. By the way, <laughs> it's not trivial here. It, you know, it looks like aliens and uh androids and uh, dolphins and things can also you know believe and desire and hope and fear it looks to me like they can and so it looks to me as if it's not going to be as if i have to have this particular human uh, nervous system or body to be in these intentional states and so that also raises some pretty serious problems for psychophysical laws that link up right the the psychological and the physical and that's what we're about here, right? We're trying to figure out, we're doing conceptual analysis. You know, what's the issue? All right. Um, over here. Here's a board. Some students took a picture and sent me the board. It's just what I've been talking about. So notice mental state number one leads to, has a causal relationship with mental state number two. That is the belief and the desire. Just what I've been talking about, combine. Um, uh, and that's the causal explanation of why the intention shows up. Meanwhile, and notice that the you know brain state number one, brain state number two, that is the, the brain itself is in some electrochemical state, let's say. Um, I have some you know uh, techno babble there, neuro bundle 62Z blah, I just made that up. Um, and so there are going to be these electrochemical causal processes following natural causal laws that we understand if we understand physics and chemistry and physiology. And it's going to lead from the brain in the state that it was in, you know, uh, continuously and seamlessly to the state that the brain's in now. And so again, intuitively, I mean, if we, you know, if we just sort of just got the flash and realized that, you know, human beings are part of the natural world, hello, um, then, you know, the first thing you sort of think is some kind of uh, reductive materialism, right? It's going to be some kind of translation from the psychological description to the underlying physical description, but that's not actually how it's going to go. Um, Okay, and then on the right there, you see Fodor's bridge, which is syntax, very interesting. I'm not going to go into it today because it's too much, but I am uh, planning on one of the next videos to be about Jerry Fodor to just try and under, just try and explain him as you know, an intro level. He's pretty hard. <laughs> All right. 
So um, propositional attitudes in animal minds, as I said. First bullet point on the propositional attitude model, a non-linguistic animal can't form propositions. And so then that whole raft of, um, of mental attributions that we say about people that they have, beliefs, desires, hopes, fears, suspicions, expectations, et cetera, et cetera. We can't say that about a non-linguistic animal. So here's my basic example. The second bullet point of the slide here. Uh, let me let me even just step out of it again, just uh, also for aesthetics. So you see the boy and the dog and they're chasing a cat and the cat runs up a tree. And the boy and the dog are down at the bottom of the tree and they're both like this. The boy and the dog are both running up the tree. It's the boy and his dog are running up the tree and looking up for the cat, as you know. Um, and so we say, uh, you say, well, what are they doing? I say, well, they, they think the cat's up in the tree. They believe that the cat's in the tree. The boy and the dog think the cat's in the tree. They're looking for the cat in the tree um, and so on. Now, according to the propositional attitude model of attentional states, again, comes out of Cartesian and sort of Chomskyan thinking uh, about mental representations. It looks like uh, it turns out that actually when I say that the boy believes that the dog is in the tree, the cat, I'm sorry, is in the tree. What I mean is that the boy has a relationship to a proposition, the proposition, quote, the cat is in the tree, unquote, that he thinks that proposition is true. That's the story we've just been told. And then it follows furthermore that the dog doesn't think anything like that at all since the dog doesn't have grammar and can't form a proposition. Therefore, according to that story, if I say the dog believes that the cat is in the tree, I mean something. I'm appealing to something. People don't use this word instinct anymore, thank God. Uh, but I, but according to that view, right, I, I can't be saying uh, that it literally believes because this is the propositional attitude model of belief and it necessarily involves, ineliminably involves, involves a proposition. So, um, and to me, that looks wrong. Um, how, how basic can I be about that? It looks to me as if uh, I'm kind of into usage in terms of the way we think about whether you're using language in a legitimate way or not. It looks to me like I'm using language in a legitimate way. And I would say in the same way when I say that the dog believes that the cat's in the tree and the boy believes the cat's in the tree. But of course, that's the, you know, that's the issue that we're talking about here. You know, that's what's, that's the issue of contention. Come on up, there you go. And you, all right. Um, so last bullet point of the slide, it seems clear to me that what I mean, and again, here, this issue is about meaning, right? Is what I mean when I say the boy believes the cat is in the tree is just exactly the same thing that I mean when I say the dog believes that the cat is in the tree. And somebody is coming up with their sort of strange <coughs> intellectual white lab coat on and telling me something really counterintuitive. If they're trying to tell me that it's just not true that uh, a human believes things the way a dog believes things or a dog believes things the way a human believes things. It looks manifestly, well, it looks to me, uh, to quote a smarter person than me, that I just have to look and see. Um, well, so what I want to do now, though, because I mean, I'm a philosopher, right? So I'm going to want to raise, I'm going to raise some philosophical problems philosophical problems with propositional attitudes. In fact, what I'm raising here are philosophical problems with mental representations in general. The whole idea that the right model of nervous system function involves representations. Notice that's kind of a radical claim on my part because um, a lot of people, for example, would just assume that we're gonna to have to have some sort of information processing model of nervous system function. Um, and routinely in the neurosciences, and I'm not saying they're illegitimate or something, I'm not trying to warpath people or anything, but, you know, just again, looking at concepts, but people are always talking about movement and flow of information when they're talking about neurophysiology. You know, you know just flagging that as an issue, we're talking about concepts. Um, so before I do that, then I do wanna say this, um, why not? Um, attitude check, 
pardon the pun, different kind of attitude. If I go to, uh, I wish it was another one of these, get, let's get out of thinking. Um, so here I am, I'm a philosopher, a humanities teacher. Uh, suppose I'm at the cognitive science you know, uh, conference and I start to say, well, you know, you guys, I mean, you, you have this representational theory of mind that among other things, looks like you're committed to propositions. And I'm gonna tell you some metaphysical problems about propositions. And I, I mean, I know this is true because I've actually sort of been through this, although I, you know, I don't really put myself in harm's way this way too much. But uh, look, a lot of people, especially like experimental psychologists or cognitive scientists, uh, people who do a lot of math, you know, well, those people are going to say, oh, come on, you know, this guy's just a lotus eater. You know, I'll, I'll have what he's smoking. I mean, he can talk about this kind of stuff, but who cares? I mean, we're just going to go, go on with our research. And our research is going to drive what we believe about mental representation. Um, <coughs> but let me just point out a couple of things. <laughs> Two things. First of all, uh, I'm the one who's saying that physical science is the study of physical relationships, causal relationships between physical things and processes and, and properties. I'm the naturalist, I'm the physicalist. Uh, and that makes you the dualist. Uh, I thought you weren't a metaphysical dualist. I thought you were a hard nosed scientist. And the second thing that I would point out in this context, again, as before I get on with it, is this, that if you are a cognitive scientist or a research psychologist, and you're trying to design your experimental paradigm, you're trying to build out your lab, you know, uh, and, and you think that a representational theory of mind, you're assuming that is, that a representational theory of mind is just axiomatic that it has to be true that that uh, that a right philosophy of mind is going to involve uh, reference to representations, mental content. You're the one who's supposed to be a, a scientist c controlling your variables. If it's even possible that that's not true, then you should be very interested in that. There are some issues in the metaphysics of mind that I'm interested in as a philosopher that I can see. Uh, that um, imper uh, you know, scientific researchers don't necessarily need to care about. Um, but representation isn't one of them. If you're, if you're a researcher in cognitive science, in cognitive psychology, uh, or linguistic concepts, or a whole raft of other things, nervous system function, like I've just been talking about, you really need to uh, be able to at least defend yourself in some persuasive manner as to wherever it is that you stand on the status of mental representations and mental content. It's a central issue in the whole enterprise of cognitive studies. So these conceptual analysis, yeah, I call it metaphysics. It's really look at the semantics of the terms. What are they referring to? I mean, if you want, that's just another word for metaphysics, okay? Uh, all right, so let's get back to them. And, you know, that's just a little ranting on my part, but let's get on with it. The metaphysics of propositional attitudes. Uh, first bullet point, the property of meaning something. That's what we're talking about. Again, if you want to know what intentionality is, it's, it's being about something or meaning something. And so the reason then again, that that's philosophically interesting is it just doesn't look like it's a physical property. My hand doesn't mean anything. And I don't mean anything. Um, and it doesn't look like there's any more reason to think that uh, some electrochemical process in my brain means anything, because I don't have any reason to think that any physical thing means anything at all. Um, so, uh, second bullet point, the properties, the property of meaning something, because supposedly there are these mental contents and they're about the planet Neptune and my Aunt Fanny and all the other stuff that I think about, right? So, uh, so properties don't float around in the air. A non-physical property must belong to some non-physical object, you know, uh, and these are propositions. Propositions, not sentences, and I'm gonna explain the difference right now. Propositions are not identical to their physical instantiation. So imagine what I do, you know, say I wrote on the board, let's imagine that we're in class and I write a, a box, I put a box on the board in chalk and I write inside the box twice, the cat is on the mat. 
And then I ask you, well, how many, what's, well, you know, how many things are in the box? There are two sentences in the box. That is, there are two sets of chalk dust smeared on the surface. But there is one proposition represented in the box, the proposition the cat is on the mat. There are two physical tokens, those are the sentences of the one proposition, which notice is not a physical thing. Notice I don't have to have, I didn't have to write anything down on the board, right? The kumquat is in the gumshoe. You know, it didn't have to be instantiated in a physical token to be a proposition. In fact, and this is it, you know, this is what you wanna know, by the way, uh, third bullet point, the propositions are the thing then that have those three properties that, you know, it turns out language itself and thought have that, that apparently physical things like our bodies don't have. Number one is meaning. That's, you know, sort of the core intentional property being about something else. That's our metaphysical puzzle. Along with that, then, uh, number two, truth value. Truth value, again, a fancy philosophical phrase, truth value. But, but oh, what does it mean? It just means it's either true or false. It's got the property being either true or false. And then logical relations. It's not just that I believe that the water is down the hall and I desire that I get some water. It's that I'm minimally rational <laughs> at best enough that uh, I get the relationship between those two propositions. And again, it doesn't look like I have logical relations. I have spatio-temporal relations and, uh, and physical relations, thank God. Uh, but it doesn't look like I have logical relationships with other people or things. You know, those look like the kind of properties. The, the property of having a logical relationship looks like it's something that a linguistic thing has or you know, a, a, an object like that, a formal object. Uh, things go kind of bad for Batman and Robin at this point, by the way, because, uh, you know, uh, I've been all cocky here talking about how, you know, don't really see how things can have this property of meaning, but that means I'm going to have to go quite a bit further than just philosophy of mind, which is what I'm trying to do here when I'm telling you about what propositional attitudes are. Uh, because think about the concept of meaning, reference, and all those other wonderful semantic concepts in regards to what we think about language. And if I'm seriously suggesting that we can uh, do without mental representations and the properties, the, the semantic properties that mental representations have, I'm going to have to do it for language because in philosophy of in the metaphysics of language, we think that language has the property of meaning, don't we? I mean, that's pretty much, you know, page one, line one of, of philosophy of language, right? Uh, but if we're naturalists, maybe we'd like to actually say, well, gosh, maybe we can think about language in some way other than in this sort of dualistic way. What are, again, what do I mean by dualistic? Meaning that it looks as if there are these mental properties like the property of being about something which just aren't in any way reducible or identifiable with any kind of physical properties, such as this property of meaning. I mean, <coughs> you could, I guess you could try and show somehow that meaning was really some kind of physical property, but I don't know how you're going to do that. But my strategy in terms of mental representation in general is rather the eliminativist strategy. I think that maybe what we want is to get, you know, maybe rid of some of these entities in the theory. And in fact, third bullet point on the slide, there has been this alternative to these traditional concepts of meaning all along from David Hume on, you know, um, and definitely through William James to Ludwig Wittgenstein, which is what I'm going to talk about to sort of end up the end up our talk today. So we just have a little bit further to go and then we'll be done. Um, functional role, semantics. Semantics in scare quotes and Dr. Evil quotes, right? Semantics, because it's not really semantics the way we usually think of semantics, because we usually think of semantics as the study of meaning, study of the meaning of linguistic objects. And what we're considering here is the elimination of mental representations in general, linguistic objects and so on. 
uh, or the representations of them uh, in our model of mind. So the 19th century empiricist psychologist William J James, pragmatism, we're talking about pragmatism here, developed a theory of truth and what makes something true. Of course, a, a common sense traditional theory of truth we would call correspondence theory. It's true because the world is like that. Isn't that just obvious? I mean, what more could you say about a theory of truth? Um, and James is deliberately uh, detaching his theory of truth from this notion of a, a mental state that course a representational state that corresponds to reality. Uh, he doesn't think that's the way that it works. But something's true, James proposed to the degree that holding that belief conveyed instrumental utility that is explanatory and predictive power on the believer. Look, you know, one, one, I think persuasive, I'm not totally sold on all that, but one, one persuasive argument there is that there might be a lot of different ways to approach things. You know, what you want is a way that works. You know, when we say, well, I know the way, what you mean is, you know, a way that works. This instrumentalist account can, su can support a non-representational theory of mind. You could mix instrumentalism and representationalism, I guess. But in this case, notice that the instrumentalist analysis eliminates the representational element. Okay, you don't, you don't, um, you're not trying to correspond to reality. You're, you're, you're trying to develop your own uh, predictive and explanatory power. Now, in the 20th century, you got Ludwig Wittgenstein, who really, I think, um, understands the metaphysical stakes here. And like all modern philosophers, like Hume on, on Wittgenstein certainly, uh, thinks he's sort of ending a lot of um, intemperate speculative philosophy. He's really got that character, the same character that the, the Enlightenment uh, Scottish empiricists had, I think. Um, anyway, what is it? What's functional role semantics, as the name implies? That what we're calling meaning is really the functional role that the utterance is playing. You make the utterance, and you notice, and I think this is part of the reason why a lot of linguists really kind of don't like Wittgenstein, he's difficult, because he's really saying that, say, the, the alarm call of a vervet monkey and your disquisition on, I don't know, Schopenhauer, uh, are metaphysically of a piece, you know, this is what the empiricist is always trying to do to show that these metaphysical distinctions aren't really metaphysical distinctions. Um, so uh, what we call the second bullet point, what we call the meaning of a linguistic object is what the communicator is accomplishing or trying to accomplish the aim and purpose of the linguistic act. This is it seems just not far from B.F. Skinner uh, in the sense that B.F. Skinner thought he'd have to have some sort of theory of, he could, he, could, he could say that verbal behavior was just physical behavior, but like any other kind of behavior. Skinner ran into serious problems with that, uh, exposing some weaknesses and that Chomsky took advantage of, not only in his book, Aspects of a Theory of Syntax uh, in the early 60s, but also in his review in the late 1950s of, of Skinner's um, uh, Knowledge and Human Behavior, I think is the proper name. So, um, all right, the aim and purpose, this understands linguistic behavior in the same way as all other observable physical behaviors. It illuminates it, so it cuts it, it so when, so it, it moves, it, itself away from these Cartesian dualist ideas. The quasi-magical idea of the symbol as a container of meaning, like the word sort of, you open it up and it's like in uh, Pulp Fiction when they open up the suitcase, right? Nah, the meaning is in there. And notice that maps onto the same idea that there's an inner and outer in you. You have a mind which is not the same thing as your body and what your body is doing. You got stuff in it, like the suitcase. Um, ultimately, Wittgenstein sort of has this vision that everything is surface. I think that's Wittgenstein's vision, love it or hate it. Uh, it is an austere empiricist vision that, that um, there isn't an inner. Again, I remember I mentioned behaviorism. You can either take it as, all right, well, if I just follow behaviorist methodology, then I'll, I'll ipso facto be scientific so I can do that. <coughs> I don't have to take myself too seriously. 
or you can be a philosophical behaviorist like Wittgenstein. And again, he, what, what did he see? He saw that uh, he thought he saw that everything was surface. Human behavior, human language, it's all right out there on the surface. There is no inside. That was a mistake. The mistake of the grammar, by the way, let me say one more thing about that and then I'll move on, that um, we have a, a language that evolved to deal with three-dimensional objects and three-dimensional space. And so not to deal with psychology. So when we try to talk about the mind and psychology, what do we get? This inner space with the stuff in it, nouns, you know, uh, uh, beliefs and desires, right? Um, okay. So, um, and Wittgenstein's view then is also is that things are constantly changing. Notice that if you have a classical idea of meaning, Plato had problems with this even. Uh, if you have a classical idea of meaning, that says that meaning is fixed. And in the Cratylus, Plato even wonders, well, how is it that the word, you know, maybe it's necessarily this word to say this thing. I mean, you know, um, but in fact, what we see is that language keeps changing and evolving, just like games keep changing and evolving as the decades and the centuries roll in and out, things come to be and pass away. And this notion that what's happening is that we have a sort of convention, social conventions. Uh, we make these noises to get each other to do things, to achieve things in the world. And that's that does account well for the protean uh, becoming nature of uh, language and usage, I think. Let me just point out a couple other things while we're up here at the Vista. Um, if you think that there's the external world and then there's your internal mental representation of the world, then you have the problem of wondering about the relationship between your mental representation and the external world. And that hasn't been a problem that's around for thousands of years and in all traditions and so on. People say about philosophy, philosophy never solves anything, it talks about the same thing. But that's not the case. The, Modern philosophical skepticism, like skepticism about the external world or the problem of the census, Cartesian skepticism, comes to us from the early modern period. Um, the way they thought about things in the 16th and 17th century, all the psychologists, including ones we call empiricists now. Um, and nowadays, I mean, in the 20th century, I think, uh, I think that Wittgenstein, does, I'm satisfied that he does give us a fairly good account of where that's a mistake and it's very similar to a human account in terms of proper use of the verb to know when it's when it's appropriate to use the verb to know um, again that kind of philosophy is not to everyone's taste but i find that persuasive and then finally on uh animal minds um you know if you were very much committed like the 17th century rationalists Descartes, Malebranche, Spinoza, Leibniz, if you were already really strongly committed to the view that uh, the human mind was not part of this, the causal order of physical laws of nature, then of course, uh, you're, going to, you're going to characterize the human mind in that way. And I, and then here's where I get cranky. I mean, I just see mind-body dualism all over the place today in the 21st century. I don't think we're over it yet. I think we still have more critical work to do, to more therapy to get over mind-body dualism. Uh, last uh, bullet point. For example, most theories of concepts involve some notion of representation or the other. You have ones where you have different parts and if you get a cr critical mass, you have ones where there's sort of the paradigm and then it's a match to sample. Uh, you know, if you read the concept literature, it's all like that. It's all about internal mental representations of some sort of the other. So <coughs> these linguists remind me of Port Arthur Cartesians uh, would say that my, you know, extremely athletic and clever and active dog doesn't know that she has four paws. Um, she who has certainly, since she's completely non-linguistic, has never sat there and thought, you know, I have four paws. No, she, no, she never has done that. But what do you mean by no? Um, you know, and, and it turns out that if you say that my dog doesn't know that she has four paws, I maybe can see what you mean since you think that, that the animal has to have linguistic concepts to be said to believe, has to be able to form a sentence to be said to believe, 
and my non-linguistic dog can't do those things, so therefore can't be said to believe. I mean, I understand your argument. It's just that I don't think that's the way we use the verbs to know and to believe. Uh, and furthermore, it looks as if, I mean, if a person is a being that comes under intentional descriptions, I admit it's a little circular, but nonetheless, if, if look, again, uh, you know, Hume looks around and says about Descartes, Descartes says you're only certain about something if you've demonstrated that it's logically necessary, but Hume points out, well, I can't demonstrate it's logically necessary that the sun rises in the east tomorrow, you know? Like, I don't know anything if what you mean is uh, that I, I can demonstrate that it's logically necessary. But you know what, um, if, if Descartes and the rationalists are, tr are right, that I can only be said to know something if I can demonstrate its logical necessity, then I don't know anything at all. But then what David Hume says at that point is, you know what, I know lots of stuff. So if you say I don't know anything at all, then I guess I schmow it. I mean, I guess I'll just have to come up with another word or else maybe you're wrong. Um, so, uh, so on these views, my dog can't be said to know, but you know, as David Hume would say, if you, you know, I'm, then you're, you've got a weird notion of the verb to know that doesn't match on the way, the way most people use that, use that. Is that the end of that? Yeah, it is, okay. So again, um, sort of two parts to this. I wanted to show you the propositional attitude model of intentional states, you know, figure out what intentional states are, beliefs, desires, hopes, fears, and so on, and then figure out what the propositional mo model of intentional states is, says that there are attitudes towards these propositions. And then the second part was, you know, me ranting about how I don't think mental representational models are probably right, um, which is my thing. So, uh, those of you in the class, by, by the way, remember, uh, you'll be getting this on a Sunday uh, today. And uh, tomorrow we have class and I did send you the reading, which also has a section on mental representations. So what we'll be doing this week is making sure that everybody's got all that, you know, all that model nailed down. And then we can talk about computers and some other cool stuff. Okay, all right, uh, I'll, see you, I'll see you guys tomorrow. And everyone else who joined us, thank you very much for joining us. Bye-bye.